We've already put so much carbon into the atmosphere that even if we were to stop burning fossil fuels today, there's still a good chance that temperatures would rise to dangerous levels. We all know that nature is part of the solution, but a new report says wildlife in particular may be key. These animals are not just existing, they're actually through their functioning, through what they've evolved, what they've come to be, they are actually helping to balance the carbon cycle on this planet so that we can live. Professor Schmitz has co-authored a study that says restoring and protecting just nine kinds of animals will help capture huge amounts of carbon from the atmosphere. These are African forest elephants, American bison, fish, grey wolves, musk oxen, sea otters, sharks, whales and wildebeest. Some of these are what's known as keystone species, which can change entire ecosystems with their presence. So tell me, Professor, how does this really work? Is it just because they're keystone species? Some are keystone species, but others, they just have a multiplier effect. And what they do is change the nature of what the plants do with each other. And as they're walking and feeding and releasing waste, by fertilizing the soil or by eating fruits and then dispersing seeds. They just change the makeup of the landscape and it's really their impact on plants as an important component because that changes the fundamental dynamics of how carbon is taken up and stored in ecosystems. In 2015, the world agreed that average global temperatures shouldn't be allowed to rise more than 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. But that's a huge challenge. In 1950, the world emitted just 6 billion metric tonnes of carbon dioxide. Today, we emit over 34 billion tonnes each year. So to hit that 1.5 degrees Celsius target, scientists estimate we need to remove 500 billion metric tonnes of CO2 from the air by the end of this century. In scientific jargon, it's called gigatons. We can store up to about 6.4 gigatons. Uh, one gigaton is a billion metric tons. And just to put things into perspective, um, six billion tons is a little more than what the United States emits from fossil fuel burning every year, right? So these animals, you know, can't collectively can have, have a pretty big impact. Just these nine animals that we accounted for. So that 6.4 gigatons of carbon you mentioned, that's just a little shy of what we need to get rid of. But it's hard, I think, for people like me to understand how increasing the population of something like wolves, for example, can make a difference. Yeah, so you have to think about wolves not just as players by themselves. Their impact happens because they're playing with their prey, right? So the moose is, are their major prey in the boreal forest, and the moose are quite damaging to forest vegetation if they aren't held in check. And you see that in Scandinavia, especially in Sweden, where you have huge abundances of moose. That can also happen in the boreal forest in Canada and the United States. If moose become highly abundant, they start eating the vegetation. And again, it's the trees, the plants, that actually are important for taking up the carbon from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. So if, if the moose are eating too much vegetation, then there isn't enough plant material, plant biomass, to uh, undergo photosynthesis and take up and store the carbon. This kind of domino effect can happen anywhere. Wildebeest were nearly wiped out from East Africa in the last century after they contracted a disease spread by cattle. That left vast patches of dry, uneaten grassland which caught fire. Around 80% of the Serengeti was burned, pumping even more carbon into the air. But the disease was eventually eradicated and wildebeest are back to their historical numbers, around 1.2 million. That means more grass is being eaten and the fires are kept in check. These animals are now contributing to the ecosystem in a way that the Serengeti takes up almost the equivalent of Kenya and Tanzania's CO2 emissions from fossil fuel burning. So again, here's an ecosystem in the backyard of Kenya and Tanzania that's actually helping to provide a local climate solution for those two countries. 
The species mentioned in the report all affect the earth in different ways. In the Arctic, large herds of musk oxen can pack down the snow. This helps stop the permafrost underneath it from melting and releasing tons of carbon dioxide and methane that have been stored there for millennia. And in Central Africa, forest elephants help the growth of carbon capturing trees by dispersing their seeds and trampling on other plants that will compete with them. I see from the report that we would need to get at least 500,000 African forest elephants back. Why that number? That would be a, a, a very good start. Um, if we could get them up to a million, that would be even better because that would drive even more carbon into trees because these elephants then can spread their impact across the landscape. One of the reasons why 500,000 is a good number is because we have enough parks and protected areas where these animals can be preserved. But if we really want to have a bigger impact, we have to move outside of the parks and protected areas and we have to move into working lands and allow the elephants to spread out as they increase their abundances. But that also then introduces issues with local people living on the landscape and potential conflict. So we have to worry about people's welfare too as we go about doing these kinds of rewilding projects. In terms of the 500,000, where are we now? I just want to get a sense of how far we've got to go. I believe there, in, in parks and protected areas, there are about 200 to 400,000 elephants. Oh, so that's quite good then. Yeah, yeah, that's the amazing thing. I think, I think part of the message, you know, with, with, with sort of the doom and gloom about biodiversity and the catastrophic biodiversity loss is there's this perception that it's a hopeless prospect because the animal populations have been decimated. We would have to do so much work to bring them all back, but that's not really necessarily correct. They are at numbers where if we made a concerted effort and devoted ourselves to restoring these populations, we could achieve significant gains by mid-century. We've seen a lot of rapid comeback because people have decided to enact laws and protection measures to allow rebounding of, of wildlife species. Razor went to the heart of Central Europe to investigate one recent success story the European bison. They nearly went extinct because of hunting and habitat loss, but they bounced back because of major rewilding efforts. Razor's Emma Keeling actually managed to track down a herd in Romania. Free roaming bison can enrich and aerate the soil they graze on, allowing native grasses to grow which helps capture more carbon from the air. Their presence has also boosted ecotourism. But not every species can coexist comfortably with humans. But there's a problem with some of the animals you mentioned. If, for example, if I tell a cattle farmer he's got to learn to live with wolves, he's not going to agree with me and he's probably not going to be polite either. You know, obviously, we don't want wolves running down the highway or down the middle of a town um, street um, because that's a frightening prospect. But in more wilderness areas where you do have cattle ranching, what you have to do is work with the landowners and devise ways of herding livestock that reduce the likelihood that wolves will prey on the livestock. There are many measures you can do to avoid human wildlife conflict that way, but it should some livestock be predated then um, we also have to develop compensation schemes for the ranchers um, so that you know th their loss of livelihood gets compensated for um, the public good of, of actually keeping wolves on the landscape to help fight you know, the global warming. There's already been some success in reducing human wildlife conflict in sensitive areas. In 2022, I reported from the Portuguese highlands where guardian dogs that were once a common sight on farms are being reintroduced to help farmers manage their flocks. They keep wolves away from the flock, which means farmers don't need to take more drastic action. But there's also work happening at the global level. In December 2022, the world agreed to protect 30% of the land and 30% of coastal and marine areas by the end of this decade. It's known as 30 by 30 and will cost hundreds of billions of dollars. That's another Razor story covered at the time. A major part of this plan is restoring the life in our oceans. 
I'm very interested in the example in the report about sharks and how big an impact they can have if they're allowed to come back. It is quite amazing and it's a really interesting story because it isn't really that they kill a lot of the herbivorous fish. So what happens is in coral reefs, the fish live in, you know, they, their home, their protection is in the coral itself. And then they move out of the coral and feed on the seagrass beds outside of the coral reefs. When they reach high abundances, they can overgraze seagrass beds. And sometimes they're still hungry and then they grump through the sediments again. And once they do that, then they also disturb the sediments and release a lot of the organic carbon that's stored in the sediments. And then that gets decomposed in the water column. What the sharks do is as they swim by, these fish recognize a predator and they're scared. And so they retreat back into the coral reef. It's that fear that they induce into their prey that actually is more impactful because there are fewer fish feeding on the seagrass. Just even in the coral reef in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, calculations show that there's enough carbon that could be sequestered if you maintain good shark populations to offset all of Brisbane's CO2 emissions from fossil fuel burnings. And, and Brisbane is really, really keen, you know, to have a carbon neutral footprint. So this is one way that people in Brisbane can also connect with the coral reef and really think about sustainability, um, you know, literally in their backyard. I like that you brought up the backyard because, you know, of course, most of us can't be intrepid naturalists tracking moose and wolves and elephants. What can we do at home? Is, is there actually any point in us trying? Oh, of course, of course. And, and you know, a lot of my work, actually, I, I um, cut my teeth mostly in my research as a professor studying spiders and grasshoppers and studying the kinds of interactions we write about in the Nature Climate Change article really working and doing careful experiments with the small critters and that's what inspired me actually to start scaling this up and looking at the large mammals that we report on in the article. So what we find is they do exactly the same thing that large mammals do only on a smaller space. So what you can do in your own backyard instead of planting nice green manicured lawns is create a little bit more rambunctiousness, you know, have a little bit more wildness in terms of introducing wildflower gardens in your backyard and maybe filling more of your lawn space with wildflowers and then that will attract insects that actually provide the same kinds of roles as the mammals do, including the spiders as wolves or spiders as hunters and then you have grasshoppers and all kinds of small spittle bugs that feed on the sap of plants and so reintroducing that food chain dynamic can actually be beneficial to storing carbon in your backyard and doing that tremendously. There'll never be a single solution to the climate crisis we've caused. We still need to work out better ways to decarbonise the industries that pollute the earth and improve carbon capture technology. And everyone, from individuals to governments and corporations, has a part to play. If we think about climate change and, and you know, loss of habitats and so on, it's, it's very easy to get depressed, to lose hope. How hopeful are you? What I like about this approach um, is that it's very local, right? Everybody has an affinity for their local species, they care about their local species and you can do local solutions. Um, which is different than the way things are being promoted with the IPCC or even the biodiversity conventions where, you know, we have these global accords where countries get together, the, you know, the political process says, yes, we need to do this, we need to do 30 by 30 and all that, which is, again, these are good things. They're, they're setting up the policy infrastructure to be able to do this. But where the rubber meets the road is really locally. You know, you've got to rely on local people to roll up their sleeves and do the work um, of implementing these, these solutions. And animals, they come in all variety and stripes, if you will, and they live all in all variety of ecosystems across the planet. And, and so, you know, people have an affinity for their local animal species. And by working with that, you can local people can feel like they're making a contribution to this looming global problem that, that um, oftentimes we feel like we haven't, what can I do as an individual to contribute to this big problem? Well, start in your backyard with your gardens and then continue and maybe rewilding vacant farmland or rewilding places that are abandoned from historical land uses 
but do it locally and get the community to buy in and work with the organizations that are trying to do this. And that's what makes me hopeful because it gives people a sense of opportunity or something that they can do and make a contribution.